Welcome to the House of Hypertrophy. In the last few months, science-based lifting has received quite the backlash. There's no doubt that some of the criticisms are quite reasonable and fair, but some of the backlash I've seen has extended to what is an unjustifiable extent. So in this video, I wanted to give my two cents on the matter. We'll be exploring questions such as, is hypertrophy and strength research even valuable? And does science just flip-flop? We'll also be touching on errors in research and whether all this science is just overthinking it. Let's dive in. I want to make it clear that I'll be defending science to the extent that it can be defended, not science-based content creators. In fact, whether people consciously recognize it or not, Quite a lot of the criticisms I've seen raised are actually against content creators, not research itself. There's a difference between research and the communication of research. People can say something is supported by science without this being even remotely close to the truth. Some may reference research but interpret it incorrectly or inappropriately extrapolate its findings. For example, across social media you often see so-called science-based content creators suggesting that maximizing stability is needed to maximize hypertrophy, to the extent they do everything to maximize stability. To some extent, stability is probably important. For example, it's challenging to argue that benching on a Swiss ball is a good idea for hypertrophy. But as far as most typical exercises, machines are generally more stable than free weights. Yet, we have meta-analytic evidence suggesting similar hypertrophy between machines and free weights, and this includes research on trained individuals. Related to this, I've seen some believe the bench press is suboptimal, but we just have four studies comparing the barbell bench press to other exercises while measuring muscle growth. Insofar as chest growth, the papers find fairly similar hypertrophy. As for the triceps, it's unsurprising that overall triceps growth was better with skull crushers. But quite fascinatingly, regional differences may exist, as this paper found the lateral head of the triceps grew more with a bench press than with skull crushers. Proponents of statements like these frequently base their claims on so-called mechanistic data, and some of them say mechanistic data is superior to outcome data, which I think is very much misguided to say the least. A tacit assumption here is that we know all there is to know about hypertrophy mechanisms, but take a look at this monster review paper and the conclusion it comes to. Investigations in upcoming years will continue to confirm or refute which of the discussed mechanisms are obligatory for, rather than coinciding with, load-induced skeletal muscle hypertrophy. This is in stark contrast to the extreme confidence some profess online. Now, some may say the reason the current data actually measuring hypertrophy fails to support their predictions is due to some reason X. That could be true. But the great thing is these are often testable hypotheses, and until it's tested it would be disingenuous to act as though you know what's true. Moving forward, people can make sciencey claims without any references. It's not a guarantee they're wrong, but you should have some healthy suspicion. For example, some people have implied the research demonstrates that isometrics are inferior without any references. So many were misled into thinking that science says isometrics are inferior. But that simply isn't true. The majority of evidence we have does not find worse hypertrophy with isometrics. An extreme position I've encountered a few times is that research examining hypertrophy and strength is ultimately worthless and hasn't provided anything of value. I think there is a tendency for people to forget about the value that research has already provided. Many people take creatine with the belief that it can increase muscle size and strength, and that it's a safe supplement. But why do they believe this? Many correctly point to the fact that it's been extensively studied. Although I wouldn't call BCAA and leucine supplementation useless in all circumstances, many people correctly recognize that they are not essential for maximizing hypertrophy. Again, thanks to the evidence on this topic. Regarding protein consumption, Many people aren't as concerned about consuming a protein shake immediately post-workout, since it is clear that protein timing is simply not as important as total daily protein intake. As far as training goes, there are many things that could be said on this front, but as one example, there are many people well aware that resting for short durations between sets is not essential for maximizing hypertrophy. Longer rest durations can work and might actually be better in certain scenarios. I think we shouldn't underestimate the potential of research too. 
There are certain questions that can only reasonably be answered through research. For example, what are the stimuli and sensors that initiate hypertrophy? What exact role does mechanical tension, the buildup of metabolites or muscle damage play? Currently, tension stands out as the most potent stimuli, but as mentioned earlier, there's still a lot to uncover. What is the nature of muscle growth? We all know muscle fibers can get bigger, but there are different ways this could occur. Do different training styles diverge in the way they increase fiber size? And might humans truly experience muscle hyperplasia? Continued exploration of this is happening. One certainly reasonable point about much research is that it typically provides the average results. But research has the potential to identify individual differences and perhaps even ultimately explain them in its entirety. For example, there's this review paper examining potential physiological differences between people who may grow more than others. Now, the research in this is very much in its early stages. In my view, some of the best work on individual differences has come in the last year and a half or so including a paper exploring individual differences with volume. I may cover this in more detail if people are interested enough. A critique I occasionally come across is that science flip-flops. Some say that people who follow research constantly change their training according to the latest study. Other times in my videos I get the comment, just wait until the next study comes out suggesting the opposite. These comments are understandable. It is true that we can get studies that appear to conflict with each other, but as I've argued before, there are often sound explanations for this. Firstly, not all evidence is equal in quality. If there's a study on rats that suggest isometric contractions produce less growth than dynamic contractions, but the human evidence finds similar growth, unless you're a rat, it's clear you should care more about the human data. Secondly, two studies may arrive at seemingly divergent conclusions but can be explained by differences in methods or the populations examined. Thirdly, with hypertrophy and strength research, it should actually be unsurprising for studies even with identical designs to arrive at different conclusions. Why? A lot of research on hypertrophy and strength training involves small sample sizes. With small samples, we can get results that fail to reflect the true effects due to chance and low power. If you're interested in learning more about this, check out this video where we go into more depth and detail a simulation that drives this point home. Nevertheless, what this means is that we shouldn't place too much emphasis on individual studies. You certainly should not change anything about your training based on them. Fortunately, we can leverage small sample size studies through combining their results with a meta-analysis. In fact, we have meta-analyses on virtually every key training variable – volume, proximity to failure, frequency, rest intervals, and rep tempo. These involve greater statistical power and, when done well, provide a much more solid basis to draw conclusions. Now, none of this is to say that what's supported the most by the research never changes. The essence of science is to have no allegiance to a particular outcome. And if the weight of the evidence shifts to support a different conclusion, that should not be viewed as a weakness whatsoever. Of course, such a transition is not something that typically happens overnight. Questionable research practices, statistical errors and poor methodology aren't hard to find. But researchers are kind of everywhere. Some can reveal problems with the work of others while providing solutions. For example, Excellent work by these researchers led to the startling conclusion. 85% of the 20 most highly cited meta-analyses in strength and conditioning research contained at least one statistical error. They provide advice and recommendations which, when taken on board, should help reduce the incidence of such mistakes. Note that not all these errors are of equal severity. Some may have virtually no influence on the conclusions while others may be more problematic and it could depend on the context. Furthermore, all of the meta-analyses analyzed were published before 2019 with one back as far as 2004 and most were not focused on hypertrophy outcomes. Of course, this is not to say that errors do not occur in more recent meta-analyses focused on hypertrophy. In fact, earlier this year I was rereading a meta-analysis on protein intake for lean mass changes published in 2022, but I noticed they use DZ effect sizes. 
If you're not familiar with FX sizes, what I'm about to say is going to sound like a foreign language, so just bear with me for a second. What they did is subtract the mean difference in changes in lean mass between a protein and control group, and then divide this by the pool change score standard deviation. Some people don't necessarily mind this, but it was considered an error in the aforementioned paper. When it comes to determining the magnitude of an effect, which is what we typically care about, dividing by the pooled pre-standard deviation is more appropriate. I reached out to some very smart people, and one of the researchers I contacted, James Steele, has decided to redo this analysis using some highly interesting methods. So we can look forward to a new meta-analysis on protein intake, and I'm excited to cover it when it's out. With all that said, I do believe the quality of meta-analyses is generally improving. And a fair number of the meta-analyses in the hypertrophy space that I was alluding to earlier have been released in the last few years. All of these have been done to what I think is an exceptional standard. I'll likely have some more videos on these in the future where I dive deeper into them and respond to some criticisms I've seen raised against some of them. Furthermore, the quality of individual studies is also generally improving. For example, we had this excellent paper comparing training to failure versus stopping 1-2 reps from failure on highly trained individuals. I thought they did an excellent job with the design and methods, and they also provided some training footage. They found similar growth between the two conditions, and you can learn more about this paper in this video. Circling back to the work of James Steele and his colleagues, he was involved in a study comparing different ranges of motions in just under 300 subjects, a sample size far larger than what we typically see. Moreover, they're working on a study that will compare lower to higher set numbers, targeting a sample size of 120. Some say that all this science on lifting weights is just overcomplicating it. They say to just train hard and stick to the basics, science is nothing more than a way to avoid working hard. However, training hard and valuing the basics is not mutually exclusive to acquiring a deeper understanding of the available research we have. And there's nothing in the research that says the basics or training hard does not work. Of course, if lifting science makes you feel overwhelmed or makes you overthink to what you feel is an unhealthy degree, you have no obligation to continue watching or reading up about the literature. At the end of the day, people are different. Some people are like me. We enjoy delving into the details in an attempt to understand things as much as humanly possible. Whereas others do not care for this. No perspective is superior to the other. To acquire your goal physique, there's no question that effective training is necessary. If you'd like assistance with this all while supporting what I do at the House of Hypertrophy, our highly rated partner, the Alpha Progression app, can generate a comprehensive program 100% custom to your needs. Choose your goal, specify if there's muscles you want to focus on more, and let it know how often and how long you want to train for. This process can take less than a minute. There are well over a quadrillion input combinations on which your plan is based on. Furthermore, the training philosophy is based on scientific literature. During workouts, the algorithm analyzes your past performance to derive progressive overload recommendations, thereby fostering long-term progress. Improve your understanding of your response with progression charts on a range of key metrics. The exercise database continues to grow, with just under 800 exercises. Each exercise has simplified instructions and further basic information. Try out all this free for two weeks with a link in the comments and description. And if you like it and continue, the link provides 20% off a subscription. Feel free to let me know what you think about the app anytime. Thank you for making it to the end. Feel free to check out another one of the videos at the House of Hypertrophy.